Welcome to the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast, your guide to help you manage life, money, and multiples. Each episode, host Paul Fenner, Tama Capital's president and founder, and the proud parent of four amazing children, including one set of triplets, will provide insights on successfully sustaining an active lifestyle, career, and family through comprehensive wealth management strategies, financial education, and lifestyle planning specific to parents raising twins, triplets, and more. Learn more, subscribe to the show, or connect with Paul at TamaCapital.com. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. Clients of Tama may retain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Do you feel overworked and on your way to burnout? Have you returned to running a chaotic life as we move into a post-COVID world? Burnout is the number one topic that Melody Wilding, a licensed therapist and coach, is helping to address with her current clients. A year ago, Melody was on our show when she launched her new book, Trust Yourself, and how she helps highly sensitive and high achieving professionals overcome the emotional challenges of leadership, management, and success. One of the ways Melody has seen a reduction in burnout is to take things off of your plate, not expand it, adding by subtraction. To do this, you must become very clear about what you want or are trying to optimize in your life. As Melody puts it, it's not the big obligations that bring us down. It's the small death by a thousand cuts commitments. Melody addresses three strategies that help us to stop overthinking and make decisions faster. Strategies that can also help us in our quest to define what enough is for ourselves. Please enjoy my conversation with Melody Wilding. So, Melody Wilding, welcome back to the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast. Thank you. I am so excited to be here and be uh, the first repeat guest. It's quite an honor. Yeah. So, we were just talking about this before we hit record is that we we released our first episode together literally a year ago. And I could tell your reaction on your face, like your mind was blown. Like, how did that year go by so fast? And like I said, well, that's what happens when you release a book. So, so Trust Yourself came out uh, a little over a year ago. So give our audience an update on how it's doing. And then kind of, and I'll put, put our previous conversation um, link in our show notes. So people can always go back and, and listen to that. Um, but if you can just give us a, a kind of a high level on uh, the book and and what you were aiming to achieve for it, and that that whole uh, theory about uh, sensitive strivers, if you will. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it is. Uh, you're right. I was shocked to hear that we talked a year ago because it it literally feels maybe it was three months ago or so, uh, and the year has gone by in a flash. And yes, I've been keeping myself very busy with the book. Thankfully it has done really well. Um, we're very pleased with the reception and how many people it's reached. Um, we've sold over 20,000 copies at this point, which the average book sells about 500. Um, so it's, it's, it's great in terms of that, the, uh, Chinese edition and Japanese edition just came out and we have it being translated into one more language. So it's really exciting too, to see how it's adapted for different cultures as well. Um, but it's, I, I think the most rewarding part is hearing from people every single day who say this book has changed my life who say discovering I was a sensitive striver, put everything in my life into perspective. And, you know, as an author, when you're toiling away, writing by yourself for years and you're thinking, is anybody going to get this? Will anybody like it? That's, that's the biggest honor and compliment you can receive that people not only enjoyed the book, but they read it two, three times. They've given it to family members. They're having book clubs in their company. So that sort of impact and reach is, is really just the highest honor. So that is awesome. So my question, cause I saw your LinkedIn post on like the day you said it was getting translated into Chinese. So how do they determine like what, the, like what language they're going to, to translate that into? Like, do you have any say over that? Is that like a publisher decision? 
Great question. So it is, uh, that decision does rest with the publisher. So most publishers, including the one I'm working with, have internal foreign rights teams. So they have people that are actively going out to foreign markets, pitching the book. Um, in some cases, you may have a foreign publisher approach your publisher and say, we want to buy rights for this book. Um, and of course, there's, there's many different factors most of which is how they think the book will perform in that market. Um, so Trust Yourself is being translated two different Chinese versions and one Japanese version at this point. Um, yeah, it's it. And the process takes about a year, just like it takes, you know, from the time you hand in your book manuscript to actually holding the book in your hands. Um, and the foreign publisher handles everything. Wow. Uh, they do all the translation, which is interesting because the concepts don't translate one for one. So, right. you know, there, there's some interpretation there. Um, they handle everything. They do their own um, covers. So it's really a surprise to the author when you get the book because you don't have any input <laughs> and then you just get a, you know, a stack of books in a different language. It's, it's pretty cool. So have you, gone ahead and done an audio version of the book as well? Yes. So I did the audio version uh, in tandem with the hardcover. Um, and another thing that's interesting about that is as an author, you do not automatically get the opportunity to narrate your audiobook. You audition to narrate your own audiobook. Wow. Uh, so I, yeah, I had to record, you know, just get on a mic just like this and record myself reading the book and they choose you. Um, now, some authors, I have colleagues who say right up front, I do not want to narrate my own book. And they're just involved with choosing the narrator. Um, but luckily I was chosen to narrate the book. Uh, so you go into a, a audiobook so recording studio. That's something you yeah. wanted to do. You wanted to, to narrate your own book. Yes. I, okay. I wanted to narrate the book. I felt it would be a good experience, which it was. Um, and I just felt that it's such a, it's such a wonderful opportunity to connect with readers and for people to hear stories. I mean, so much of the book is me talking about my own experiences, my work with clients. So I thought it might be a little strange if it wasn't me. Um, yeah. But you go into an audio studio and you sit in a chair for how I think it was. I think it took me three days to narrate the whole thing. Um, you have tons of tea and water and, you know, everything you need. And you have a team in there. You have an audio engineer. Uh, there's a producer coaching you. So they're coaching you on your cadence and emphasizing certain words, articulation of certain words. So it was really useful as someone who speaks and does podcasts. It was very useful training in that respect as well. So I, Jason Pfeiffer had a really interesting post. So Jason is the editor at Entrepreneur Magazine. I'm not sure if you're connected with him or not, Yeah. Um, but he actually had an interesting post because he's in the process of narrating his newest book to come out. And I'll link to that in the show notes because Jason is a, is a big fan of, uh, of the show and we kind of interact sometimes. So, and he's got a great podcast as well uh, that I'll link to, but um, it was really interesting. His, his video watching him go through, it's like, I spent all these years, you know, writing this book and then to do the audio, it's just a completely different uh, process, if you will. Yes. And that, that was one thing, if I had to do it over again, that I would reconsider in writing the book because I was, as someone who really highly values actionable, very tangible advice, I wrote much of the book like a workbook mm -hmm. so that it has lots of exercises and visuals and things like that. That does not translate as well to an audiobook. Right. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, if I had to do it over again, I might rethink or reconsider. Uh, now the audiobook does have a PDF that comes along with it, but it, it's so many people are podcast listening to audio yeah. all day. That's their primary source of learning today. Um, 
So you really do have to take that into consideration. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting you bring that up because, you know, personally speaking, like I, I've tried listening to an audio book before. It just doesn't work for me. But yet, as you know, and all my audience knows, I'm a huge podcast consumer. Like, like when I'm working, that's all I'm doing is listening to podcasts. And that's how I get a big dose of my information and learning that way. Mm -hmm. But I've never really been able to translate like reading a book versus listening to the book. To me, it's, it, I, I don't get the same benefit, I think. Likewise. I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm very much, I could listen to podcasts and music all day, but when it comes to a book and actually consuming and digesting that information, I really need it. I, you know, for the most part, I'm still a hard copy, you know, actual paper book person, physical but, book. <laughs> yeah, physical book, book person, but some things I I've transferred to a uh, digital Kindle version because at least you can highlight. And, and that's one of the reasons why I made the switch that, and just because like I was getting overwhelmed with books is that, um, being able to highlight and then download the notes and then be able to craft that in a way that helps me really get the most out of a book because for a time, and there's even some books that, that I read in the financial community that there's not a Kindle version, there's a hard cover. So like I'm highlighting all these books and then I have to pay my kids five or $10 to retype the uh, highlights for me. So, yes, you know, there's a, a great app that one of my clients told me about. It's called Readwise, and I'm sure we can put it in the show notes. Yeah. Uh, it's called Readwise, and it takes all of your highlights and notes from ebooks, articles, any, any digital information that you've highlighted and it resurfaces the insights to you. I think uh, maybe a weekly or a monthly or even daily um, newsletter digest. So you keep things top of mind, but it can also import your highlights as notes into certain applications like Notion or Evernote. Yeah. And I was like, this is brilliant. I had never heard of it before, but now when I say it to people, they're like, oh yeah, I've used Readwise for years. So um, it's really handy. Yeah. I've never heard of that, but I will definitely check it out and put it in the show notes as well. So yeah. let's, let's come back to the genesis of the book for a yes. few minutes and talk about, you know, what's it about? And, and really that whole um, concept that you developed in, in this term sensitive striver, what does that mean? What, what are you trying to, to let people know about? Yes. Being a sensitive striver means that you are someone who is highly sensitive. You think and feel everything more deeply, but you are also very high achieving. You're driven in your career. You have big goals for yourself. You're always craving to learn more and do more. And that combination is very powerful. It makes people extremely conscientious, uh, caring, empathetic, kind, wanting to make a huge impact. But at the same time, what I found in my own experience and what I saw in my coaching work for 10 years is that sensitive strivers weren't given the skills they needed to succeed. And they get stuck in the downsides of their traits, which when unbalanced, that sensitivity and that ambition can look like self-doubt, imposter syndrome, perfectionism, a lack of boundaries, right? There's this whole constellation of challenges that comes when we're not channeling those qualities effectively. So that's why I wanted to write this book. It's really based on my, my research, my coaching work for the past 10 years. And I wanted to give people a plan. I wanted to give them a step-by-step -step process for overcoming some of the biggest challenges that are standing in the way of them being more successful. So have you, since, since the book has come out in, in its, and you've gotten feedback, whether good or bad, has, has anything changed? Like, would you go back and do anything different? Like, is there, is there anything else that you like look back and realize, oh, I should have put that in, or I should focus more on this part of the book or this part of what I was trying to get across versus something else. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I finished the book right when the pandemic started. So I 
luckily had the opportunity to go back in and quickly add some pandemic references. But this was, I think I finished the book in March, 2020, before I handed it in. And so, I mean, the the world and how people think about their careers and what they want in terms of balance and lifestyle has completely transformed. So right. I wish I had had more time to, or just the opportunity to talk about some of those aspects because being able to navigate boundaries and um, being able to think about what do I want out of my career and what's the best fit for me, people are having totally different conversations with themselves and their employers now. So um, that I wish I had the opportunity to add. I get questions all the time about, should I tell people I'm a sensitive striver? How do I talk about that in my workplace? How do I share this with my boss? So I, I do wish I had more space. You know, you you a book is you know sixty to eighty thousand words, but you'd be surprised about how much you have to cut out. Cut out, yes, <laughs> yeah. And I, I wish I had more space to go into some of those some tactical questions like that. Well, actually, that's a good lead into one of the questions I wanted to ask you, which is on this topic and, and somewhat tactical, is that now that we've started opening back up, you know, one of the things that I personally feel and see in myself and in, in the families that I work with and talk talk about is it seems like we've just, we're now right back to where, maybe not right back to where we started, this may be a bad choice of words, but hopefully the, the audience will get my gist with this is that we slammed the brakes, shut everything down. Our lives became to a certain degree less busy. And now we've just opened up the fire hose again. And especially with parents, parents dealing with kids, because now, you know, for, every, for a long time, everything was shut down. There was no sports. There was no taking your kids to extracurricular activities. And now I feel like all that has just amped right back up and people, including myself, are like, where did the time go? Like this, this last school year just, you know, went by in a blink of an eye and here we are, you know, approaching the July 4th holiday. So what have, have you, A, have you experienced that yourself and B, what, what do you, what are some of the tactics that people can utilize to not necessarily slow things down. I mean, makes mainly just become more aware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I have seen this, this sort of whiplash of, we went from nothing to everything. And of course it was, it was somewhat a gradual transition, but I have been talking, I would say burnout is the number one topic that's coming up with coaching clients lately. And I think it is because we went from one sort of burnout, which was pandemic fatigue, isolation, back to life at 110%, get the kids into all of the activities, get back into doing extracurricular things for work and building relationships and networking and going to events and traveling. And it's, it's sort of like, I keep having conversations with people about how they just keep trying to expand their plate instead of taking things off of realizing that their bandwidth and their plate is limited and taking things off of that. Um, so I'm seeing that. I'm also seeing an opposite effect where some people are really happy and thriving because there is an aspect of their identity that they lost during the pandemic that's coming back. And I see this the most for my parents because during the pandemic, they were, they were everyone's caretaker, right? They were the lunch maker, the, <laughs> the school teacher, the referee, they had to be everything. And they didn't have, they didn't have their identity outside of their family. So now that they're able to go back to work, they're able to be at events and be by themselves. And it's bringing back an aspect of their identity that they that they felt was lost or was hidden by all of the demands of the pandemic. Um, so it's been an interesting, um, it's been an interesting effect to see how certain people are responding to it differently. Yeah. I think that that point you made, and I jotted this down as a note is that 
I don't think, and I struggle with this myself, is we always look at expanding, expanding, expanding what we want to do or our scope of work rather than taking a step back and looking at, okay, what can I take off? Like, what can I subtract? And there's a, there's actually a book in my Kindle <laughs> that I haven't gotten to. Um, and I, the name of the book is subtract. And I forget who the author, the author is. I think it's L I E D E Z leets maybe, mm-hmm. but uh, maybe I'll link to that in the show notes too. But I think that's a really powerful concept to think about because as we went from zero to 60, and I'm glad you brought up burnout because I see that in a lot of the families that, that I work with because now work from home is, is depending on who you work for and what really kind of what part of the country you work, work, work in companies are starting to force people to go back. So I wanted to get your take on that. Like, what are you seeing or what are you hearing from your clients on this sometimes forced return to work or hybrid return to work or voluntary return to work? Yes. Let me underscore your point though about subtraction. And that's so important here. There's a concept I talk about early on in the book around giving up goals and that's so crucial now because so many of us getting back to, you know, real life, quote unquote, we collect so many shoulds. Well, I should participate in this. I should go to that event. We collect all of those expectations and we don't think about what, what do I actually want and what is a heck yes for me. And so I just want to leave listeners with that. If something is not a heck yes, it should be a heck no. Um, Do you have any strategies for around helping the people that you work, you work with get to that point? Like to, because again, you, you start with, I'm using my arms, like my, like the audience can actually see what I'm doing, but Mm -hmm. this big plate, I think that's a good analogy that you used previously, that this big plate and you got to narrow it down. And I think that's one of the hardest things that people face, not only from a financial standpoint, a personal standpoint, a parenting standpoint Mm -hmm. is how to shrink that damn pie down. Mm -hmm. A few things. So going back to this idea, if it's, if it's not a heck yes, look at situations or obligations that bring up a sense of resentment in you. Resentment is a very, very strong emotional signal that you have let a situation go on too long and you're not addressing it. So it may be uh, resentment over a particular obligation to family or, you know, a PTA that you made. Um, it could be resentment over uh, maybe you told a colleague you would help out with an assignment. Now it's six month, months later and you're still involved, if not involved more with that insign- assignment. That resentment is a good uh, litmus test to draw your attention to what needs to change and what needs to come off your plate. I find for sensitive strivers in particular, asking for help is crucial. Realizing where you are over-functioning, where you are taking on more responsibility, more than your fair share of of a relationship, where you are fixing, you are problem-solving for people, where they could easily do that themselves. And so because I work with people in a professional context, often I see this with leaders and their team where they are not delegating enough. They are fixing work that their team member does instead of coaching them on how to make it better. So I don't, I don't know for most of us, I don't think it's the uh, big obligations we have to say no to. It's the sort of daily, you know, death by a thousand paper cuts that add up to a huge energy drain on you. So even just thinking about and realizing, you know, where is that sense of resentment? Where am I taking on more than my fair share of responsibility? Now to your question about return to the workplace. Yeah, this has been a contentious issue. I have to say that most of the clients I work with have been given a hybrid situation. They have been given, many people have been given autonomy about how much they do or don't want to return to the office, having the choice to do that 
if they want to do that at all. Uh, I have many clients who are being told to come in two to three days a week and can be at home the other three days. And I do have a, a small handful of people who have been mandated to go back every single day. And I, I will say this is a generalization, but I will say that there is, there's a lot of pushback to that. Um, there's pushback among my clients themselves who are people who are, tend to be a bit more introverted and reserved. You know, we sensitive people, about 70% of us are also introverts, but being someone who's sensitive, usually we work better in environments we can control because we can control the level of stimulation that's around us. Right. So it, it just works better for us to be in our own spaces many times. Um, so they, they don't want to lose that autonomy and they're, they've been very effective, if not more effective working from home. And many people don't, you know, lots of my clients live in cities, San Francisco, New York, Chicago, and they don't want to add a two hour commute or a four hour commute, two hours each way back into their schedule when they could use that time for family and working. So, yeah. Yeah. I think that it's, you, I think you hit the nail on the head because a lot of people I talk to that, that are facing that is that whole commute situation. You don't, I don't think many people realize like how bad a commutes that they had because they were just doing it because of their job or their career. Mm -hmm. And you, you read study after study that you're, you're much better from a health standpoint, a mental standpoint, physical standpoint, taking less money and shaving time off your commute than the opposite. And that's, that's actually one of the things that even myself, I realized with, with my firm at Tama is that I wasn't spending hours a day or weeks in a car driving to meet with various families or appointments or whatnot. It just all shut down and now it's pretty much virtual. And even for my, my, my families that live here in Metro Detroit, a lot of them will still, still say, well, well, let's just jump on a, a Zoom call because they don't have to you know, make the track over to, to, to my office or you know, I don't need to, to make the track over theirs. And sometimes that really works. I, 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 there's a, a gentleman that I work with that's like, well, do you really want to have that style or of, of business? And on one hand, would I prefer to see them in person? Yes. But on the other hand, there is a convenient factor to it. And the fact that I realized that I've, I've grown, especially the last couple of years, where a lot of my families that I'm now working with are outside of the state of Michigan. Um, they're in 10, 11 different states. And even the people I work with here in Michigan, sooner or later, will move. They'll retire. They'll move down south or wherever they want to go. And it, it will turn into a more virtual relationship anyways. So that that whole time of getting that back, when you get that time back, it's kind of go, kind of covers what we're talking about here. When you get that time back, it's hard to give it back up. Absolutely. You get you get accustomed to that freedom and that agency. And what what we know in psychology about what motivates people is mastery, agency, autonomy over their work. And so 100%, I can see especially why families value that flexibility because they can pop in, pop out. It fits into their busy schedule, but they're still getting things done. Right. Yeah. Um, so let's pivot kind of to this, this other point I wanted to talk about that you had, you had this post on LinkedIn. And I think this is part of the, the LinkedIn learning that you're about, which I would like you to explain exactly how that how you came about being in that, what exactly is LinkedIn learning? But the, the one that got my attention the most is this topic on three strategies to stop overthinking and make faster decisions. I think this goes back to that question I was asking earlier about, okay, what are some of the tactics on how we can overcome this idea of taking our plate down and not adding to it, subtracting rather than just keep throwing things on. So walk yes. us through what, what this is and how you ended up on this topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I'm very grateful for the relationship I have with LinkedIn and LinkedIn learning. Uh, I am one of their instructors. They have 
thousands and thousands of courses, many of which are very short. You know, they're designed to be bite sized, but highly impactful and powerful. So I think most of my courses are, are under an hour for sure. Um, but they're meant to teach very tangible workplace and professional skills. So, uh, what you're referring to that, that post was, uh, about the content in my overcome overthinking course, which is by far my most popular course on LinkedIn. And, uh, I think that speaks to what a challenge this is for many people. So uh, I have that course. I have another one on learning to say no at work. And I have two new courses. One just came out as we're recording this. And that one is on managing burnout. And I have another one. (laughs) Very timely, very, you know, apropos to the moment. Um, And I have another one coming out in July. That's about uh, regulating your emotions in response to workplace challenges. So... Yes, this topic on not overthinking and going back to that idea of how do you how do you adjust what's on your plate? One of the concepts I talk about in that article is this idea of satisficing. <laughs> so satisficing is a term that refers to a combination of satisfying and sufficing. So what we know in psychological research is that there's two primary styles of making a decision. You have satisficers. Those are people who look for the good enough option. They are content with B plus work. Then you have people who are maximizers. Most sensitive strivers tend to be maximizers. These are people who examine every single option. They want to find the best possible outcome, no matter how long it takes. Maximizing, as you can imagine, is where perfectionism comes in, is where overthinking comes in, because we're we're just trying to maximize. We're trying to find the number one ultimate solution. And sometimes when we're making a decision, there isn't one right option. So a method I teach in that course is to be clear about what you're trying to optimize for being clear about what your key criteria are for making a decision, because then, you know, what you're trying to maximize for and what you're happy to satisfy on. So if you're making a business decision, you may look at, um, cost profitability, the risk level, the impact it's going to have on your customers. If you're making a personal decision, you may look at the time involved, the convenience, the impact on your family, um, the ease of getting started, right? So thinking about those key decision criteria, and I actually provide a tool in the course where you can map this out for yourself and actually compute a number (laughs) for, for each option that you're trying to make a decision around and see which one works best. Um, but I find even just doing that mental exercise of asking yourself, what am I trying to optimize for here can be very clarifying because that help that can help you make a decision between competing values. And I know that's probably something that comes up a lot in your work is that people have competing values and they have to figure out which one do I want to lead with here? Yeah, I actually, it's, I use this analogy of a pie <laughs> coming back to a plate or a pie where you have this, your everybody's pie is only so big, whether you have $100,000, a million dollars, whatever you have, everybody only has a certain size pie. And you want to slice that up the most effective, efficient way that will lead you to what you want to achieve, whatever goals, objectives. And they're not always financial. And that's the one thing that I really strive or stress to, to my families I work with is, is the financial planning process. And that's the biggest stereotype there is about what what I do as far as an advisor goes is that it's all about numbers. It's all about, um, you know, a financial plan, if you will, but really what financial planning is, it's more emotional and behavioral driven than it is, you know, calculating, you know, you know, numbers on a spreadsheet. I mean, that's the foundational part. I mean, that's, that's uh, table stakes and what we do today. 
the real value is in that planning and understanding a person's behavior, behavioral aspects, if you will, and especially going through what we're, we're going through right now. Like we're in, in the middle of a, a bear market correction, you know, the stock market's down anywhere from 20 to 35%. And so it's being that calm voice of reason in a, in a, in a panic. But to your point is, and this is why I'm always really interested in, in, in researching how people make decisions and how you go about setting those priorities because you can't have priority one, a one B one C one D. And I, I actually take that away from my years of being in corporate uh, finance and operations, because I felt like a lot of the companies I worked with or worked for were the, were like, well, we need this, 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 and this done. And I'm like, it's impossible. It, 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 you can't have that. And I sometimes will have that same conversations with families and be the bearer of sometimes True, the truth is an, is an inconvenient uh, choice or decision, but that's that's really what it comes down to is you can't have everything, but you can have most things. And I know when Teresa listens to this podcast, my wife that, you know, uh, she's like, oh my God, Paul tells me that all the time, but it's, it's the, it, it, it's a foundational truth to what I do in my work with families is that most people don't give themselves credit enough credit for what they can do because they're more focused on what they, what they can't do and what they're potentially missing out on. And that kind of misses the point. And I think that that's why I love having you on and having these conversations because you come back to it and, and that you need to decide what it is that's a priority for you and your family. And that's when I start meeting with families, we start with what are your values? What are your core being, if you will. And like, well, why would you lead off with that? Because that you have to start there to be able to build your objectives. And then from your objectives, it's what action items we take to help get you to where you want to go. Yeah. And you know, there, there's an entire chapter in trust yourself about defining your own definition of success. And that whole chapter is grounded in identifying your core values because those are your internal compass. If you are not identifying not only what those values are, but what they look like in action, because you know one of my personal values is independence. But my version of independence is being able to choose what I work on every single day, where I have friends and colleagues where their version of independence is traveling the world. And that, mm-hmm. that's not me. I'm perfectly happy to stay home all the time, <laughs> but you have to, you have to be able to identify what does that value look like in action every day. Um, and that can really guide your decisions in a really powerful way. And I think coming back to like the, so the question I always get in and, and ask, but I think I'm starting to answer it on my own is, well, how do people do that? And I think the first basic step is to give yourself, and I know you can't make time, but to give yourself the time to do, be able to do that. Like you literally need to walk away from things, whether it's going for a walk outside, you know, by yourself or with your spouse, if you're trying to do something together like this, but it's, it's making it a priority. Like it, it's the Einstein's definition of insanity. You keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result. Well, things aren't going to change unless you change. So, and it sounds very basic and simple and to some degree it is, but then as you start pulling off those layers, like you did in that, in the chap in that chapter of trust yourself, there's, there's more to do there. There's more complexities, if you will, but it, it's, it's got to start with you making the decision, whatever that tipping point is to make the time to do it. 100%. And, you know, that, that brings us back to that article about those decision-making strategies to stop overthinking because one of them in there, and I truly think this is maybe the most important one is honing your intuition or rather reconnecting with your intuition because, and again, I, I will defer to you on this because I am sure you have many stories about how the numbers and logic only go so far. You have to have an emotional element when making decisions. And 
while that might sound a little woo woo, so much research shows that the best decisions, and by that, the ones that have the best outcomes, but also the ones that people feel most confident in, confident in, and that feel like the best reflection of themselves is when they are combining logic, you know, the pros and cons list with the emotional, intuitive, gut feeling side and pairing those two things together, not pitting them against one another. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, you, I think you nailed that spot on. And that kind of goes to the, the last topic I wanted to, to talk about is I think that over the last couple of years, even, even before COVID, I started focusing on this project of defining enough, like what is enough? And I, and I started it selfishly for myself, but also be, probably because I saw a lot of that in my families that I work with that were struggling with what is enough? And if you go back to like pre-COVID, we're right, and kind of how we let off our conversation, we're right back there with this whole busyness of our lives. And it kind of inter, intertwines with this sense of, well, what makes you, what, what's, what's your definition of happiness? What's your definition of success? And it, it varies, obviously, you know, everybody's uniquely different in that way. But I'm wondering what in this journey that you've experienced with writing the book, your research, you know, all these additional uh, LinkedIn learning classes that you're putting together is how, how do we help people define what is enough? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's such a good question. It's such an important question because we live in a world where we are made to never feel enough or to feel like we never have enough. So in many ways, it's, it's a radical act <laughs> to feel content with who you are and what you have. Um, so in the book, there is one chapter where I talk about sustainable goal setting. And I talk about how, how my belief is, I think where typical goal setting fails is that it's very binary. It's very all or nothing. You achieve the goal or you didn't, or the goal is just to keep going after more, to keep moving the goalpost further and further and further out. What I advocate for is tiering your goals, having levels of your goal. So you may have, I call it commit. You have a commit level where that's the base level that's your goal floor. You have to hit that or you haven't been successful. Once you hit that, you can have a commit level. So that's your goal level, or I'm sorry, your base goal. You have a challenge level, which is you're pushing yourself. That's a little bit of a reach. And then you have a crush it level where if that happens, it's gravy, it's awesome, but it's not necessary, right? You shouldn't expect to hit your crush it goal. That's what happens if the sun, moon, and stars all align. And I find that that's helpful for people because it puts a cap on what is enough is hitting that commit goal and doing that consistently, right? And it's it's very easy to think about this in terms of finances, right? You sort of have a base number that you want to hit. You might have a, a challenge level, a little bit of a a push, and then you may have a, a crush it level for your level of income or whatever finances. Um, and so I find, I find doing it that way helps people conceptualize where they're falling better, helps give them some parameters rather than operating in this more is better mindset all the time. That I think that is a extremely valuable point And I think a very uh, great way of, of capping our conversation. So uh, Melody, if, if where's the best way to find you, is it, is it LinkedIn? Like how can people access like these LinkedIn learning courses that, that you've put together? Sure. You can come on over. You can follow my profile on LinkedIn. You'll be able to, uh, watch my LinkedIn learning courses from there, which are free with LinkedIn premium. If you message me, I will also send you a uh, special link to watch them for free. So go ahead, connect with me. Let me know you heard me on the podcast and send me a message so I can send you that. You can also find me at my website, melodywilding.com and the book anywhere books are sold. Yeah. If you haven't read the book, people get it. It's, it's great. And as, as Melody said, as we let off, you know, the, the great thing about putting that out there is the response that you get back from people and that, Oh my God, this changed my life. And 
You know, I think that's where we kind of work in similar fields on the impact that we can have on people, which is, which is great. So I do have one last closing question for you. And it's the one I ask all my guests, but I always have to pivot for you because you're not a mom yet, but you're soon to be a wife. You're getting married this year, uh, which is, which is terrific. So what is the one thing you're looking forward to most about getting married? Oh, you know, it's funny because my fiance and I have been together for 10 years now. So, uh, it, we've just known each other so long and I feel like we built a life together, but I'm, I'm really excited for making a home together. We, we have lived together, but we have not really built a home together. So we'll be moving, uh, later this year. And I'm just, I'm really excited for that process of making something our own. That is awesome. That is awesome. So Melody, I can't thank you enough. We're going to have a, a ton of links in the show notes and obviously we'll get to, to your link on, on um, LinkedIn and the book, but I can't thank you for being the first uh, repeat guest on the show. I think, you know, we covered a lot, which, which we always do. And a lot of great topics that, that people are asking about that are very timely as well. So um, I can't thank you enough. And I still look forward to all the more conversations to come. Thank you so much, Paul. It is always my pleasure chatting with you. I always have a blast. So thank you so much for having me back. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast. Please visit TamaCapital.com to subscribe to this podcast or to connect with certified financial planner and registered investment advisor, Paul Fenner of Tama Capital. And please join us again next time on the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast. Mm-hmm.